the crypt. How's it going, freaks? This episode of Tales from the Crypt is brought to you by the folks at thecryptocandle.com. So head over to thecryptocandle.com and pick up one of their candles. There's a chance you'll also be buying a whole Bitcoin for $45. You read that correctly, a whole Bitcoin for $45. How does it work, you ask? Well, 5,000 candles have been produced. Each candle has a token with a unique code embedded on it, buried in the wax. 53 of the 5,000 tokens, around 1%, are redeemable for a little bit of Bitcoin. 50 of the tokens are redeemable for 1% of a Bitcoin. Two of the tokens have a half a Bitcoin on them. And one token among the 5,000 has a whole Bitcoin on it. What you do is you let the wax melt down to a certain extent. You take out the token. You go to thecryptocandle.com and see if your token is redeemable for a bit of Bitcoin. Uh, when you're at checkout, make sure you use the promo code CRYPT, that's C-R-Y-P-T, to receive a 10% discount on your order. And uh, hopefully you can thank Uncle Marty later for, for getting you some cheap Bitcoin. That's uh, the promo code CRYPT, C-R-Y-P-T, at thecryptocandle.com. Hope you guys enjoy this interview with Jameson Lop. What's up, freaks? Welcome back to Tales from the Crypt. It's your boy Marty Bent. Here on a Tuesday morning, it's blockchain week here in New York City. It's crazy. The suits have flooded. Getting away from the chaos, getting an early morning start here in Flatiron at Barstool Sports Studios. Uh, we're here with Jameson Lop. Jameson, welcome to the podcast. Glad to be here. Thanks for coming on, man. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Jameson is a professional cypherpunk, creator of Statoshi, uh, infrastructure engineer at Casa Hodel right now and was previously at BitGo, but most of you may know him from Twitter, because he's a uh, pretty, gives pretty sage advice out on Twitter. So yeah, Jameson, I'm just curious, what is your tale? How'd you find Bitcoin? Uh, well, I can never actually remember the specific article, I'm, but I'm pretty sure it was a Slashdot article mm -hmm. um, in like mid to late 2012, and and I'm sure it wasn't the first time that I had read an article about Bitcoin, but for whatever reason, um, I, I read that article and was like, hey, this thing hasn't gone away. I thought it was going to get hacked and, and would die. And so I started looking into it more, you know, read the white paper, but then uh, the real catalyst that helped me get past a lot of my initial questions and doubts was that actually um, one of my fellow co-workers sitting in the cubicle next to me, I lean over and I asked him, hey, you know about this Bitcoin thing? And he was like, oh yeah, I've been mining and trading it for a couple of years now. And like, oh. <laughs> so, you know, he was able to answer a lot of my initial questions and then I I got you know more obsessed with it than he mm -hmm. was and, and went a lot further than he had. And, um, you know, we still keep in touch and I still try to get him to go full-time Bitcoin. Uh, you know, which I ended up doing in 2015, and it's it's been a wild ride ever since then. I feel like everybody is like enthralled with Bitcoin is on that journey to f find a way to work in Bitcoin 24/7. And yeah, well, I mean, I felt like I was already in it 24/7, <laughs> just you know, trying to be a part of the community and understand. And and once I saw all the venture capital money flowing in, I was like, well, maybe I can stop doing this while I'm at my other job and just be doing it while I'm at a job that is actually in the same industry. Mm -hmm. No, and that's a uh, that's a crazy thing about Bitcoin too. It's like it's a self fulfilling prophecy. If you want to contribute to it, you can add to the network effect. There's many ways to add to the network effect. You can run a node. You can create the website that you did, which is incredible. It's my favorite resource in Bitcoin. Go to lop.net, his Bitcoin resources page. A plethora of links that, that'll, that'll, it's my favorite place to push people down the rabbit hole. So I click on a link, a link a day for the next year. And yeah, pretty much. <laughs> and, and you'll learn a lot about Bitcoin. Um, how how active is that site? Do you know? Do you know how how much traffic it gets? Yeah, I mean, I've got some like Google Analytics on it, and you know, obviously, it follows the hype cycles where you know during the peak at the end of 2017, it was getting thousands of hits per day, and you know these days, you know, it's more like a few hundred hits per day. Um, and if anything, though, it's becoming more active 
from a community participation standpoint because I ended up open sourcing it. It's on GitHub, and I get a few pull re requests uh, per week now. Oh, people really? wanting to either add links or fixing broken links. This is actually one of the banes of operating this thing is that I've yet to find a good automated crawler that will just notify me when one of the links breaks because there's a lot of links on there. There's a lot I'm of not links. not clicking through them all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's got to be an arduous process to figure that out. That's what, like... That's what messes me. That's what happened to me on Twitter recently. I was looking for a conversation. Somebody changed their Twitter handle. Mm -hmm. It's just like the conversation just get, jumped into the abyss. Um, yeah. So, what are you most interested in in Bitcoin right now? What are you focusing on? Obviously, you're working on Casa Hodel. Um, how's that process been? Yeah, uh, we're actually we're trying to get the the Casa Twitter account because because everybody thinks the name of the company is Casa Hodel. Um, so it's just Casa like. Mm -hmm. uh, like a house or castle or what have you, and um, I've been you know in the security space for a little over three years now. At Bitgo, I was primarily working on infrastructure for their hot wallet security, which provides a lot of unique challenges and, and is really a nightmare. You know, trying to help people operate hot wallets, and now I've pivoted. Uh, and at Casa, we are trying to build the ultimate user-friendly uh, cold storage solution, the be-your-own-bank, be-your-own-vault type solution. And the way that we're doing this is we're trying to merge the usability of a mobile app with the security that you get from hardware key signing devices. So the, the Casa app will be just on your phone, and this is a three out of five multi-sig solution. You can... Um, you can have one key on your phone, like in the secure element. Um, that'll be a default, though. I'm, I'm going to be pushing to also have an option to, to not do that and just have yet another device. But then you will have, so you'll then either have three or four hardware devices. You can bring your own, you know, Trezor, Ledger, uh, in the future, you know, who knows what else, uh, Keep Key, perhaps any popular device we want to be able to support. Um, or um, we also anticipate basically being a reseller of those devices. And you'll you'll basically set up your wallet, initializing it with all these different devices, and then Casa will hold a fifth key as a recovery service to help out with certain disaster scenarios. And then when you want to actually send money out of this vault, um, you're going to have to go around and um, go to you know the different geographic locations where you are keeping these hardware devices. And so the interesting thing about this is. The hardware devices do a great job of basically making these things unhackable. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you could still get like socially engineered or potentially uh, have uh, malware in in some of the software you're using, and you send it to the wrong address. But um, most people who are using just a single hardware device are now prone to other types of loss, like natural disaster, um, end of life scenarios that they haven't thought through, and so. We think that by distributing these physical devices, that's going to provide yet another layer of protection that not many people have. And we're actually going to be recommending that they do not keep their seeds for these devices. Really? And, and this is because when we, we thought through um, the security issues with Bitcoin wallets, you know, the very first thing that you do with a wallet is you get a 12 or 24 word seed and you have to write it down. And what does the wallet tell you? It says, store this in a safe place. <laughs> well, I, personally, I believe that is a big fail right there for the average person. Would agree. That, so, was, uh, that was a funny meme that uh, Niraj had on, on Twitter last week when uh, they were talking about Wences, Cesar's uh, underground tunnels. Yeah. He was like that feeling when uh, they're talking about these, these nuclear tunnels where people, the rich are storing their their Bitcoin and I have mine and my seed on a on a post-it note, my sock drawer. Exactly. That's a lot of people's uh, security these days. Yeah, and so you know we we figure that uh, we want to help guide users through best practices, and the best way to do that is to help them avoid as many situations where they could easily shoot themselves in the foot due to um, ignorance or just not understanding security. It seems like the uh, the Casa model sort of disincentivizes the five dollar wrench attack too, to a certain extent. Yes, that's that's definitely another thing. Now you know there's always going to be some level of physical attack where mm -hmm. you might get held hostage, but you know if you are being held hostage and then you have to be taken around um, a lot of different uh, of places, uh, especially if you keep 
some of those keys in like uh, access controlled, uh, you know, bank vault or, or whatever, um, it's definitely going to be a lot harder uh, for them to pull that off. But like with regard to actually keeping track of the seeds, instead of keeping track of the seeds and then like trying to restore the hardware if you lose it, mm -hmm. we're instead going to um, be supporting basically key rotation within the app itself. So we're, we're, we have this concept that we call the key shield that will be displayed front and center in the software. And it'll do things like every once in a while, um, ask you to sign a message to verify that you still have the keys mm -hmm. so that we can be sure that you haven't lost them. And if you can't do that, or if you lose a device or device fails or whatever, then there will be a very simple wizard for you to basically go through and uh, say, you know, this device is lost or compromised, I need to replace it, and uh, walk through the wizard and basically reset up your wallet and transfer the funds to the new set of, pri of public keys. Mm -hmm. That includes the new one where you've replaced the last one. So basically what we're doing is we're trying to get away from having a requirement for the user to, to keep track of, of any unencrypted data or, or digital keys or whatever. Instead, the user only needs to keep track of a few physical devices, which I think is a lot easier for the average person to get their head around. Yeah. That's, uh, would you argue that's probably one of the biggest hurdles UX-wise for mainstream adoption is holding your own keys? Because what, what we're seeing is that people are just trusting these decentralized third parties like Coinbase, Gemini, all these exchanges, and I... <sighs> I think we need better education and private key management to, to sort of incentivize people to take. Well, it's a psychological thing, too. People are used to holding their monies in banks, yeah. and there's going to have to be a sort of a paradigm shift of, of how people view money and, and securing their own money. Um, well, it's definitely, there's the convenience factor. Mm -hmm. um, there's um, really the fact that, like, even even highly technical folks, I've, I've spoken to a lot of people, who they're just not comfortable with having to go through all of this, and so they would actually rather trust um, a specialist. Mm -hmm. You know, that's that's what we do with banks, right? Is um, we trust the security specialist to take care of all those issues for us. And uh, of course, we we're <coughs> all familiar with the trade-offs of trusting you know particular specialists to to <laughs> do things on on our behalf, but. Um, this is why, despite the fact that there are so many awesome, cutting-edge, mind-blowing uh, stuff happening in this space, why, after uh, being in this space for like five or six years, I'm still just focused on private key management because <laughs> I feel like it's this foundational thing that we are still a long ways uh, from solving properly. Right, and that's that's one of the thing that er one of the things that irks me about the space right now is the impatience of everybody. Like we have a protocol, like the altcoin world, the ICO bubble, whatever you want to call it. It's everybody acting out of impatience. They want everything out of the box right away. And these technologies have been iterated on for decades. And we just got Bitcoin just under a decade ago. And it's going to take time to, to fortify the system. Like, if you had to put, like, a timeline on it, I don't know if you could, but... You know, I, I think that we've come really far in 10 years, you know, going from zero to um, having probably tens of millions of people that actually use crypto, having these huge conferences with 8,000-something people at them, um, getting s daily mainstream uh, media attention. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think I was seeing some statistics recently that something like you know, over 80% of people are, are at least, like, aware of cryptocurrencies. It's crazy the normalization that's happened over, like, the last year and a half in particular. Like, finviz.com, which is a website that I used to frequent a lot when I worked, like, at a hedge fund to follow market prices. They have a whole crypto page right now. It's crazy. It's, uh... I didn't think it was going to happen this fast. Yeah, and, and so I think it's, it's easy to um, overlook how far we've come and and you know still see that we have a very long road ahead of us and we want to get to the end of that road as quickly mm -hmm. as possible and i guess i uh I, I tweeted something recently where i was like you know eventually the, the 
the protocol is going to ossify and Bitcoin is going to become boring and then we're going to stop talking about it. And <laughs> can't wait for um, that Yeah, I, I kind of look forward to that day. <laughs> um, it, it'll also be, um, it'll, it'll be, you know, bittersweet mm -hmm. that we succeeded, but now, you know, hopefully by that time there will be some new cool thing that we can be working on. All right. Ossifying the protocol. Do you think that's possible? Um, I think it, it's pretty much inevitable with any protocol that achieves sufficient adoption. And mm -hmm. at least at least if we're talking about like decentralized internet protocols, you know, you look at SMTP or HTTP, any of these low level protocols. Um, I, I challenge anyone to like go out and try to find people who are debating making changes to these protocols. I mean, it's, it's just not happening. Mm -hmm. um, now, there was, I guess, HTTP2 uh, finally came out recently after many, many years of development. Um, actually, like Mike Belshi at Bico had contributed to that like before I think he even got into uh, doing Bitcoin stuff. That's mm -hmm. how long that took. But um, I, I fully expect that um, if, if the protocol uh, continues to the point that it has like sufficient market penetration, then it just becomes too onerous to try to change it. Mm -hmm. And so then we start building stuff on top of it because you don't need to get that same level of consensus to change it. What, uh, what are the features that you would like added before ossification? Um, well, do you think Bitcoin could survive in perpetuity um, as is or? You know, it could survive, but you know, I think one of the, other than of course, scalability stuff. I mean, I think the, the biggest, uh, failure in Bitcoin is privacy right now, yeah. is that it, it mm -hmm. just has terrible privacy. And that's why we have so many other blockchains out there that are competing on the basis of privacy alone, mm -hmm. is because that is one of Bitcoin's uh, greatest deficiencies. Yeah, fungibility is going to be crucial. That's that's what I've been saying is going to be like the next SegWit battle, is making Bitcoin fungible. Well, yeah, I mean, and that could definitely get interesting once again with the like culture clash between uh, Asian miners and the rest of the world. Culture clash. Let's let's jump into that. <laughs> <laughs> there's all, there's a lot of culture clashes going on all over the place between competing protocols, between different uh, stakeholders within the incentive system. It is crazy. You have it is a global decentralized system, and you're having to cooperate with people that frankly you really don't understand their culture at all and so it felt like during the segwit and bitcoin cash debates that the chinese miners just felt like westerners weren't respecting them enough and sort of what they've done which i would agree, agree is merited to some extent like mm -hmm. without bitmain we would not be where we are a lot of people hate on bitmain but i've been saying this a lot recently they were one of the few companies early in the early days willing to take the monetary risk and they're reaping the rewards right now um, so what, what's your, what's your view on the culture clash and is there, is there anything we can do to sort of bridge the gap? Hmm. It's, it's tough because I, I can't claim to actually understand, uh, you know, their, their culture mm -hmm. all that well. Um, it's, it's tricky because you can, you know, view the like power balance between the, the different entities in the ecosystem um, in different ways. And, you know, some people see miners as the powerhouse that, you know, is continually building the blockchain. Mm -hmm. Whereas other people uh, view them more as, oh, you know, it's the rest of the ecosystem that's actually creating the data that goes in the blockchain, and all the miners are doing is time stamping it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and so it's... There's, there's no real, like, right or wrong perspective there. Like, they're both correct. Um, but then then you get into the debate of, well, who really has, has the, the power? power? Yeah. And so that's why all that, the UASF stuff and uh, Segwit2x and all of that was fascinating to watch last year. And I was actually disappointed that Segwit2x got called off at the last <laughs> minute because I wanted to see what was going to happen. <laughs> Nothing would have happened, right? They would have missed it, or it would have like well, grinded yeah, to a halt. Well, yeah, we found out later that it would have just, you know, <laughs> completely jammed up. Um, now, I'm sure that eventually they would have fixed that bug, and it would have proceeded forward, but... Uh, Jeff Garzik's on to pushing an ICO now, so he's not too worried about it anymore. Um, yeah, I think he's put that, that whole mess behind him. Hopefully he's been shamed into irrelevance. <laughs> <laughs> Won't make you comment on that. No, but it was interesting. We found out, like... The intolerant minority has the power in the, these networks. Like uh, node, like full node operators 
Would you? Oh yeah. Uh, uh, one way that I've put it before is that like the 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 most powerful thing in in Bitcoin is uh, apathy. Um, you know, you could say the most powerful thing is it's the power of no, but but no is the default. Mm-hmm. And so it, I think it ends up being more the power of apathy because the the default is a uh, disagreement uh, with with breaking changes. I would say I'm pretty up. Ap- right. how, how many what percentage of the network would you say is apathetic? I'm gonna put a... um, you know it is it's hard to say um, you know despite all of the the like a uh, arguing and vitriol and and whatnot that happens on social media, I think that you know there 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 is no real like representation of the Bitcoin community. And this is one of the things that that I find kind of amusing is a lot of people who get upset because they like look at a uh, subreddit. That's what I was going to say. It's our Bitcoin. Yeah, it's, yeah. So many it, people who think that like <laughs> our Bitcoin is the Bitcoin community. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like you, maybe maybe that's the only place that you go to. Um, but <laughs> honestly, like I've been following Bitcoin since like 2013. I rarely go on Reddit. I don't like Reddit. Like I just don't like the UI of Reddit. It annoys me. I've definitely uh, stopped talking and conversing to many people on Reddit. And in general, I, I, I find Twitter to be uh, more better signal to noise. I do as well. Why do you think that is? Um, I think it's just because you have more power to curate the, mm-hmm. your own experience. Right. That's one thing. Yeah, people that hate on Twitter, I'm like, you're not using it correctly. You have to Probably not. Right? You have to create lists. You have to... Yeah, you do have to put some work into it. And, right? and then, you know, a lot of people get pissed off on about different Reddits and... and uh, you know, they might be pissed off at, at the Bitcoin subreddit because they don't like how the moderators do certain things. Or you might be pissed off at the BTC Reddit because you don't like how the community on there does things and, you know, downvotes people for certain stuff. But um, Just don't yeah, go there. Yeah, just don't go there if you don't like it. I mean, there <laughs> are like dozens of other options for uh, places to talk about this technology. Yeah, what I've actually seen more... Over the past years, people diving into like private chat groups. Yeah, yeah. Well, a lot of the conversation happening there. Um, I mean, that's been happening uh, f- for the last five years. That I've been following it, but I feel like more uh, there's been more and more people diving into these these side chats. This is actually the the tough problem for me is trying to ingest all of these different data streams so mm-hmm. that I can stay up to date. And I mean, I'm constantly throughout the day. Um, I'm hopping back and forth between uh, Twitter and Telegram and WhatsApp and Slack and IRC mm-hmm. and some Reddit um, and probably a few others that I'm not even remembering. And it's, that is because the community is so diverse and spread out and all over the place. And I'm not even hitting everything. I mean, I, I'm well aware that like there are big like WeChat rooms and there are lots of, of, of forums. Um, like I don't go to Bitcoin Talk anymore. But you know, I'm sure, that, <laughs> I'm sure there are still people who who discuss things on there. But remember Bitcoin Talk? That was I do remember the good old the day. days of Bitcoin Talk. Yeah, yeah. No, that was um, is Cobra Cobra still still uh, behind the helm on that? Correct. Um, I thought it was Thamos. Thamos is it Thamos? Yeah. I think so. Um, still waiting for the uh, million dollar. Uh, Bitcoin Talk 2.0 form of software, <laughs> by the way. It's been a few years. I'm not sure what's going on with Did that. they raise money for that? Um, I think so. I forget where the money actually came from, but it may have been through uh, various uh, fundraises or actual just ad revenue yeah. uh, that, that it made over the years. Yeah, I don't really get a Bitcoin Talk that much anymore. Um, that's crazy. It feels like I feel sometimes I feel like Jon Snow in the Battle of the Bastards, like when he's climbing up. Do you watch Game of Thrones? Oh, yeah. Now? When he's climbing through like the bodies, the survives. Like this wave in particular, after the bubble of December, it's brought in so many people. It's just like sometimes you have to like get your bearings straight. There's so many new voices like clamoring around. But how many of these? How many more cycles do you think we'll go through before Bitcoin becomes more normalized? Hmm. Uh, I think we've still got a few more to go. Yeah. Um, the, I think the the real question is how do you know, you know, when when we've hit like the saturation point? Yeah. 
What do you think drives it more, like the the underlying tech and the security of the network, or the geopolitics, like around it, the mm, geopolitical uh, state of the world? Um. Well, I mean, this is like a, a very viral technology, mm-hmm. so I think that you know the the reason why you see the waves happening like this is is because um you know a few a few things may happen like on the tech side that get people excited and then you know you start to see evangelism and and basically uh the viral network effects start to spread and basically grab hold of a a new set of uninitiated people mm-hmm. and then those people some of those people may get excited and, and you know that's they then do the same thing and it repeats until eventually it peters out and like there's no one really left to who wants to get excited at this phase because they the rest of the world uh does not yet see anything particularly interesting about it and then eventually it collapses in on itself and mm-hmm. you're you're left with the people um who or more likely to have gotten excited due to philosophy or fundamentals of it rather than just like speculation and trying to get rich quick. Yeah. And then the cycle repeats. So let's dive into the philosophy behind it. Like that's what another interesting thing that's been uh it's been like as these waves come in is is sort of the Bitcoin's roots are very anarcho capitalistic. Um Bitcoin's monetary policy is very Austrian, it's very conflicted with the current way the world works yep um so you think we have to convert minds as we convert people to bitcoin as well um convert we're using very religious undertones here well it's so there's two ways to look at it um one way which i think i tried to do a lot in the early days was yeah convert people like reason with them like explain to them why this is the superior thing Mm -hmm. and i actually stopped doing that um, and instead, um, well, these days I wait for people who are interested to come to me and ask, you know, f- questions and want to be educated. Um, but, but I think the more powerful thing is to demonstrate, you know, the, the utility behind these networks mm-hmm. and, um, you know, actually getting people to use them and, perhaps like showing them use cases for for things that they wouldn't normally be able to do um now one i think one result of if you can get people into the system and then they hold on to their value and they see it go up a crazy amount and they they start to realize that like the economics of this system are more beneficial than their savings account or whatever then that's one way to get them um, I guess more permanently uh, mm-hmm. interested in the system <laughs> from an economic standpoint, and never uh, met anybody that hates money. And uh, it, it, there's no real one one answer though, because of the diversity of people who come into it for many different reasons. Mm-hmm. And, and so that's one of the reasons why I st- I stopped like proselytizing directly to people, because. I don't necessarily know what their <clears throat> interests are, and so I could very easily miss the mark and be wasting my time. And so, for me at least, it's easier just to put educational resources out there and let people who are interested enough find them and then make their own decisions. Yeah. What do you think is the uh, like the number one catalyst for the aha moment? I would say for me, it was like creating my own personal wallet and writing down the seed phrase for the first time, being like, "Holy crap!" Like. That was an aha moment for me, like taking it off Coinbase, creating your own wallet, and sort of interacting with the system that way. Yeah. Uh, well, for me, I mean, it was actually making a transaction and getting something <coughs> in return. That was, mm-hmm. and of course, this was a long time ago uh, when uh, you, it was really hard to get Bitcoins. You basically had to go to Mt. Gox and <laughs> you know, do it, send an overseas wire transfer. And so at the time, it definitely had much more of a feel of this is some sort of like play token thing. But once you exchange that for something else, perhaps something that you can hold or something that you then make use of, then you're like, oh, no, you know, this really is money and people are treating it like money. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, I, th- I think the first thing I ever bought with Bitcoin was like a pair of shoes. I was like, holy shit, mm-hmm. I got new f- fresh kicks. <coughs> but um. There's another like tricky subject we can jump into is like how 
different agencies, different states, different municipalities are are defining Bitcoin, and it sort of pisses me off as we we can't use it as a currency at, like we use without without an extreme tax burden. Um, so, do you have uh, sort of a definition in your mind of how Bitcoin should be defined on a regulatory level? Well, the tricky thing about Bitcoin and a lot of these crypto assets is that um, I've referred to them as like chimeras. Um, the, they have properties of multiple different asset classes. And so the result is that um, you actually end up having multiple government agencies all wanting to define it in a way that suits them best and gives them the most regulatory control over it. And, um, you know, time will tell how, how that plays out and, and whether or not it, uh, it really even matters. Why wouldn't it matter? Because, um, you know, regulatory agencies, I mean, they can, and politicians and whatever, they can pass all the laws that they want, but if they can't actually enforce them, Mm -hmm. then it's just a joke. So uh, that's why I think it's particularly going to be interesting to see what happens with the SEC and how they react to all of these different offerings. And, um, you know, I suspect that they may end up having to to basically give up on trying to define a lot of these things as securities because some of them some of them are kind of securities some of them actually seem to change between being a security and not being a security and like i just i think that the complexity of some of these crypto assets is such that the uh, government agencies can't possibly be like flexible and fast enough to actually deal with them yeah no, it's crazy watching the uh, Senate hearings about cryptocurrencies, and it's funny. Some of these politicians are so tech illiterate. It's like how they're not going to be able to keep up. They can't make. They can't even pass a budget, let alone make yeah, overarching um, decisions about yeah, this stuff. This part of the the. I mean, there's a lot of arms races that are constantly happening. You know, there's arms races around security, around privacy, around regulations. And um, and this isn't new, you know. Um, th- this is why um, cutting edge technologies often get uh, adopted by criminals because they are aware that you know, governments are slow to to adopt and understand various technologies. So if you can stay ahead mm-hmm. of government agencies, then you've got a big edge. So you know, if the like, crypto asset ecosystem can continue innovating in, in crazy ways then outpace uh, the ability for governments to keep up with it, then that's a very interesting edge that these uh, systems have. Yeah, and that's what, uh, I'm pretty sure I picked up this book because of your recommendation, The Sovereign Individual. Mm -hmm. Um, That's what they jump into. A lot of is cryptography has created uh, a shift in the the logic of violence and the leverage that that individuals have over these nation states now. Do you think we transition to a a post-nation state world? Uh... If we do, it's going to take a while. Yeah. <laughs> it's definitely not going to happen anytime soon. Because like, that's like... So that's been like the ethos of the cypherpunks, sort of the overarching ethos over the last 30 years, is just creating technologies that enable sovereign individuals to, to live in peace. Yeah, I mean, there's a, a lot of overlap between the cypherpunk and the crypto-anarchist yeah. movements. And... Uh, you know, I think that uh, crypto anarchy is a, a logical extension of like cypherpunk ideology of you know, sort of taking it to its final conclusion of, of what happens when there really is no way for an authority to control the entire system. Yeah. How did you get into it? Like, would you consider yourself a cypherpunk first that found Bitcoin or? No. Uh, well, I mean, I was I was a libertarian mm-hmm. um, and I mean, I had I had gone through all the political ideologies uh, over the years. I mean, I was raised in a very conservative household and ended up going to an extremely liberal university um, and, you know, ended up being let down by all of these uh, political parties. I mean, um, I guess by the time I got interested in Bitcoin, I considered myself a libertarian, but, um, you know, libertarian party and its candidates in the United States let me down uh, a few times over the years. I didn't fully agree with everything that they were doing and it was bitcoin that then led me to like anarcho-capitalism and voluntarism mm-hmm. and uh it's it's been a you know it's 
I guess, been most interesting because I felt like Bitcoin could actually make that a reality. Um, now, I definitely get a lot of pushback on this uh, from you know people who believe that, that we need nation states simply because we've had them for so long and that's how things are. And um, I think a, a constant pushback that I get is this belief that like voluntarism or anarcho-capitalism will be a utopia. And I definitely don't think it'll be a utopia, mm-hmm. but what we're you know really trying to do is fix the the root underpinnings of society to, <laughs> to be not based on violence. Now, um, there's a lot of tricky things that are, you then have to get into after that, of like how are different uh, like public services going to get right. replaced and whatever. People can't fathom it. Like conversations get heated sometimes when you when you talk about sort of replacing nation states. People can't envision a world without governments and how would you envision like a transition we'd get like let's paint the picture of what uh, uh, cryptography enabled peaceful like anarcho capitalist world would look like might not be peaceful well I mean the the I guess most important thing that people are worried about is is how do we replace uh, public infrastructure and public services uh, anything that is currently socialized, mm-hmm. um, and and so the the interesting thing is that when you look into services like uh, healthcare or um, roads or or plumbing or whatever, those services tend to actually be uh, performed by private companies, I mean private contractors. Mm-hmm. It's just the government is just coordinating. So the, I think the fundamental question comes down to how do you uh, coordinate in a like less authoritarian way and then how do you fund uh, those particular things? And, and so in a, in a voluntary society, it would be more based on funding based on usage. And I think the, the reason that that has not really been possible before is because um, actually figuring out, uh, you know, pay-to-play type usage for all these things would be incredibly onerous. Mm-hmm. But once we are in a, a future where it's a lot easier to make like metered micropayments um, and, and automate a way to, to remove a lot of the friction that would be required for that, that's when I think this type of stuff actually becomes possible. Yeah. That's um, the microtransactions uh, subject. It's a touchy one. People, some people don't think it could succeed, but um, so is this a world? Do you think that would be enabled with like Lightning Network or? Yeah, I mean potentially. Uh, Lightning networks uh, have the ability, I think, to enable uh, whole new classes of economic interaction mm-hmm. that just aren't possible right now. Yeah, it sort of goes back to what enable what I believe it would enable something uh, like Balaji. Uh, described in the machine payable web, right? Mm-hmm. So you'd be able to just... That's when things get really interesting, when the machines just start paying each other, oh, yeah. and we don't even interact. Um, do you think a lot of Bitcoin usage in the future will be machine-to-machine? Machine or? Yeah, I mean, I don't see why not, um, especially if we we end up basically creating this machine economy. I mean, the machines need to talk... They need to talk to each other, mm-hmm. you know, and and interact economically somehow. Now, they could just, I guess, do that with their own private databases that, that some company sets up, like a Visa-style thing, but um, mm-hmm. but uh, it would be more powerful if they were using an uh, open public network. Yeah, an open public network. Actually, one paper that came out, I believe it was yesterday, I don't know if you've read this yet, but um, mesh networks and sort of, so a lot of uh, Bitcoin transactions are, are relayed over the internet right now. Yeah. Uh, Blockstream has a satellite above us, uh, another yeah. avenue through which you could you could relay transactions. And then this is an inter- interesting one that came a uh, story about it dropped yesterday. Uh, basically, TXT or TX Tena, excuse me, working with Samurai Wallet to create sort of a mesh network where you can relay transactions while not being on the internet or not being on a cell network either. So how would do you know like much about these mesh networks and how 
A um, little bit. Um, the, uh, there are actually a few folks at the conference who are, you know, doing mesh networking stuff, uh, including one guy here in New York. And, and you know, this is another, I think, fundamental piece of infrastructure that we need because um, you can make some pretty good arguments that the Internet itself is not decentralized enough, uh, you know. Mm -hmm. We still have too many choke points at ISPs that are easy for for like nation state actors to manipulate uh, or tap or shut down or what have you. And so I, I am very hopeful that over the coming years we will see the Internet become more uh, like a truly decentralized peer-to-peer -peer network. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that'll still probably start off... Um, more centralized at first as we see large companies uh, like blanket the earth via satellites and drones and hot air balloons and all that stuff mm -hmm. but um, but once we do have this like blanketed internet then it should be like that much easier to start creating your own uh, mesh nodes to then uh, be able to prop propagate around at ground level yeah and, that, and that's a again like you said like it's important thing to think about in regards to decentralization is you need multiple ways to relay these transactions and so right now we have it through the internet satellites a mesh network uh, I believe Nick Zabo and Elaine you are working on shortwave radio tra transmission yeah yeah they were working on basically you know being able to bounce signals off the atmosphere to relay them like over uh, borders of nation states that may be <laughs> trying to censor you but you know that's really really low bandwidth uh, but but high censorship resistant yeah. operation. That's uh like who who would use that? Like in what scenario would you have to use like a short wave? Would it be like possible to do that like on a mass adoption level, or would it be very specific use cases? No, I think it would be more specific. I mean, at least right now, it requires uh, you know setting up specialized hardware, and um, I guess if I recall correctly, one of the other tricky things is um, you. You have to be careful about like how you're, uh, you know, directing those signals because it would be possible to triangulate them if you, if you're just like broadcasting all over. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, you it's a it very cypherpunky uh, type thing to do. I, I'm not sure like how far they intend to take the technology, like how the easy they want to make it to use. You just have to prove that you can do it. It's crazy. And then you have people like DeSantis talking about bouncing radio waves off the moon to do it that way just use the moon as a satellite yeah it seems like a long way to go though because <laughs> my understanding is that normally you can bounce them off the ionosphere mm -hmm. yeah i was actually talking about that with bitcoin sign guy last night believe it or not oh. we we're talking about bouncing stuff off the ionosphere um incredible kid uh one of the best memes in bitcoin to date i would say uh buy bitcoin behind janet yellen um so there's I don't know how to jump into this topic because the swatting. Are you okay with talking about that? Yeah, I mean, I haven't uh, revealed like all the details of it. I have a blog post though that I'm, mm -hmm. I'm going to go into all the details soon. Okay, <laughs> so we'll let the blog post speak for speak for uh, the whole experience. But like in general, it's a social engineering attack. Uh, you think stuff like that is going to uh, become more common as Bitcoin price appreciates? Yeah, well, you know, this is um, kind of an interesting aspect of, I guess, the rise of crypto anarchy is mm -hmm. that now, um, due to the, the level of anonymity that sophisticated attackers can pull off on the Internet, they can actually exploit vulnerabilities that nation state agencies have created. Mm -hmm. And that the main one with swatting, of course, being that these... Uh, um, emergency call centers will take a call from anybody even if they don't know who it is or, or where it came from and they will um, they're they're basically um, instructed through their own government protocols that they have to treat everything as potentially real <clears throat> and so the result of that is that um, you've got you know this one random guy uh, ends up spending like 10 minutes of his day and is able to expend probably in excess of $100,000 of public resources to lock down <laughs> my entire neighborhood with dozens of police units and, and the SWAT team and the mobile command unit and EMS 
and I mean, it was holy shit. It was crazy. <laughs> holy I was, shit. I mean, that's. I was, you know, obviously I was upset that that someone targeted me. I knew that it was a possibility, but um, the the more upsetting thing was just the general. Um, waste of public resources because I mean I'm a taxpayer and so some of that is my resources too mm -hmm. and and I know that this is not a, a one-off incident um, there have been many others like it and as far as I can tell they continue to happen and um, the law enforcement agencies don't seem to actually be doing anything to try to close this vulnerability the only the only thing um, that that I know now is that uh, my particular local law enforcement agency has me on a list that says if this guy, you know, has a call co that says it's from his house, you know, saying it's a life or death situation, call this phone number first to verify with him and make sure that it's not fraudulent. And I'm like, that is not Holy scalable. Shit. I mean, that's cool that you're doing that for me, but that is not scalable. Finding that in the moment would be, I can't imagine that would be easy at all. That's ridiculous. But... But at, like it goes, this plays into the drug war too, because a lot of these mm -hmm. municipalities need to justify their budgets. So, in particular with the drug war, like these SWAT teams love going on on missions to to knock down doors and kill dogs for for a, a minuscule amount of marijuana. Well, you know, we actually saw I think just yesterday uh, news out of uh, Georgia, just uh, near Atlanta, where there was actually. Um, a heist being planned by four or five guys. They were planning on stealing a bunch of Bitcoin, like arm robbing Bitcoin from a guy. Uh, might have been somebody we know. You know, there are some Bitcoin operations happening in Atlanta. But uh, they actually, it, as far as I could tell, coincidentally got busted by the cops while they were planning in the hotel because someone alerted the cops to suspicious possible drug activity. <laughs> but they weren't, they weren't drug activity they were actually planning a, a, a bitcoin, bitcoin armed heist. robbery yeah holy shit there's uh there's many ways you can get attacked you can get hacked on the internet uh we saw what ryan selkis earlier this week somebody mm. got a hold of his twitter account yep. uh, because they phone ported him phone ported him that's another problem like how come the phone companies can't get this together like, uh, well, that's another awesome thing, I guess, about, once again, the rise of crypto anarchy is that these systems are actually creating new incentives that um, make people find and exploit vulnerabilities that have been there all along, but there was never really a good reason to do it. And so what we're seeing now is that phone providers just have terrible security practices with regard to um, locking down your account and making sure that you are the rightful owner. And um, the, you know, the, only, the only solution that I have for that, because um, what we saw with Ryan and a number of other people is that they were still, they're still trusting these third parties and they're going to them and saying, hey, uh, you know, um, put additional security on my account. You know, don't let anyone uh, change the number t uh, unless I like, physically come into a store with two forms of identification and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And inevitably what happens is that a human does not follow that protocol and therefore the security protocol is completely worthless <laughs> because these, these, uh, these attackers, you know, they just keep trying. You know, if, they, if they get a support tech that follows the protocol, they hang up and they call again and get another one. <laughs> and so the, the only solution that I have to that is uh, to use a phone service that does not uh, support phone porting. Um, mm -hmm without actually having a unique code. Uh, so like I use Google Fi and uh, anyone is welcome to try to port my phone number, uh, <laughs> but they can't do it without the unique code that I put in because there are no humans that can, that have the ability to port it without that code. That's interesting. <coughs> That's, do you, you're liking Google Fi? Yeah, I've used Good them price for, point? for several years. Um, they, you basically pay for what you use. It's like $10 a gig. That's not bad at all. Even international, which is awesome. It works in like 100 countries. That's crazy. No, but it's also crazy, like, um, like all these attacks and, again, like crypto, like WannaCry, all these uh, hospital computers getting, getting ransomware for Bitcoin. It's Bitcoin is helping expose that the emperor wears no clothes when it comes to internet security. Yep. Equihash, or Equifax, excuse me getting my words mixed up um that's another big one like that was 240 million 
uh, social security number is just gone. Mm-hmm. So it seems like we might have fucked up on Internet 1.0, Internet 2.0, whatever you'll consider it from a security perspective. Like, Well, yeah, I mean, we created all of these silos of sensitive information, and then, you know, the attackers only need to go get through one door in order to get huge volumes of, of important data. Yeah. It seems, it all, I don't want to get heavy here, but it almost seems like a ticking time bomb to, like, a fight club like mm-hmm. scenario yeah um yeah. if well or or even uh i guess what was the the other like uh cyberpunk d- dystopian uh tv show uh mr robot yes mr robot mm-hmm. that that seems pretty plausible <laughs> i've never do i've never dove into uh mr robot uh, but okay. I, I a lot of people tell me i should but yeah it seems Actually, there was a Mr. Robot clip going around right after Facebook made that announcement about eCoin. Yeah. And uh, it's funny because you see these like big corporate entities enter. Like Mark Zuckerberg comes out like, we're going to, we got a blockchain team now. We're putting our number one guy on it. But it's like, ah, this is like against the whole ethos. Like you can't. I'm definitely interested to see what they come up with. Uh, Do you, you know, think they make a Facebook coin or? I mean, you know, so far the announcement was so vague that it could be anything, and you know, the uh, odds are in the favor of them doing something stupid with regard to <laughs> blockchain. Uh, it's you know, it's very hard to I think do it right, do it in a way that actually makes sense. Um, and in most cases, I think that any like blockchain-based protocol that is basically being written and administered by one company is probably doomed to fail. Yes, yeah. it just doesn't make sense. Antithetical to the ethos, like I tweeted out like all right facebook you want to get in just experiment with lightning network and make it easy for facebook users yeah send bitcoin between each other and buy bitcoin do that and the network effect you'll create by doing that uh will make that bitcoin more valuable in the long run you know i mean that's why i really like what square is doing with their cash app (coughs) square cash app is is on point have you used it yet oh yeah yeah the ux is incredible the bitcoin's in your wallet right away it's you can withdraw right away it's uh it seems like jack's building a bank right and he's got the credit card connected to the app now and he just announced that they've got a lot of deals with with retailers where you get the uh, um where you get like the uh, cash back mm-hmm. which is uh which is pretty cool and it seems like he 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 might be a bitcoin maximalist as well that's the the rumblings that i've heard yeah yeah yeah, he came out with a bold prediction like Bitcoin reserve currency of the world in 10 years. That would be crazy. And we've got a long way to go t- till then. Uh, trillions of dollars. Yep. Um, all right, we'll wrap it up here. I'll have a wrap up question. So, are you optimistic or pessimistic about the state of Bitcoin at the moment? Um, definitely optimistic, um, especially with the uh, Lightning Network. I, I just. <laughs> I see a whole new wave of innovation happening um, because basically innovating on these second layer networks is going to be so much easier um, to do. Like it's, you don't have to worry about getting in contentious debates with people about changing protocols. Um, you can basically be be writing your own stuff and um, not have to get permission. So I think like the permission permissionless innovation on the second layer networks is is going to be a huge boon. And um, the folks that I talked to about it, like uh, Alex Bosworth, who worked with me at Bitco for a while, and um, you know he's basically diving headfirst into thinking about this uh, new ecosystem. You know he's always um, coming up with this new stuff. Um, mm-hmm. He's like, oh, I was thinking about this and that, and I just realized that you can do this cool new thing. We never even thought of it before, and so it's just this new uh, like acceleration is what it feels like and and seeing a whole new uh, class of developers get interested yeah that's that's the other thing the developer uh drain or not drain like it's uh interesting seeing developers get more and more interested with this and where would you say the state of like the development world is and from a developer perspective i mean ethereum has the developer community down pat Mm -hmm. right how would you compare bitcoin and ethereum's development community so there are very different, I guess, uh, development philosophies between the two communities. Mm-hmm. And I think that Ethereum community tends to be 
like easier to get into. Um, mm-hmm. They're you know they they put a lot of of effort into being like easy to get up and running and and you know write your first DAP type of thing, whereas uh, in Bitcoin it does tend to be a steeper learning curve and there's more focus on you know being conservative and, mm-hmm. and security practices and whatnot, and so it's definitely harder uh, for for new entrants. And that's why I think we, we can benefit from more developer outreach, and that's why I like to see the stuff that like Jimmy saw mm-hmm. and Chain Code and stuff are doing. And you know, I want to see more of that um, because we're definitely seeing an impact from it. Yeah. No, it's uh, Jimmy's class, and then what Chain Code and comp- things like uh, Block sh- the things that companies like Blockstream and Chain Code are doing are awesome for the space. Um, the Chain Code residency is uh, very impressive. From, from what I can tell and they sponsor one of the best meetups in the city thanks for the free pizza <laughs> um, but you have to go on to another podcast uh, where can we find out more about you Jameson well it's all on lop.net <laughs> l-o-p-p dot net um, and do you have a parting word of wisdom for the freaks out there um, well you know you asked me if I was optimistic or pessimistic and, and I think that the answer has to be for everyone to be optimistic because mm-hmm. these systems are only going to be as good as what we put into them and so while while there is some benefit from from having like adversarial thinking and like trying to pick things apart in general you should still be optimistic that you know there are a lot of of great talented people that are devoting their lives and and resources to uh, getting us towards this vision of a future in which you know no one controls money <laughs> and you you basically control your own money and and even that's only the very beginning of of what i think is like the future of crypto assets and and really the like uh digital lifestyle is that we have this set of people that are trying to bring control back to yourself and, and it's not just about money i think it's going to be about identity and reputation mm-hmm. and and just all of your data in general is is getting that back under your own control and so that's why i'm still working on private key management because i think it's going to be a, a key piece to to owning yourself mm-hmm. and 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 that's where we get once once again back to that concept of the sovereign individual is that uh, you know you own everything about you and this gives you like the the best level of, of freedom that you can possibly have wow powerful stuff one day at a time people one day at a time um, that was an incredible interview and uh, you can find me at Marty Ben on Twitter if you like this podcast please rate subscribe share um, peace and love It was fun.